our uh, guest, Adam Burkhammer. He's a delegate out of the 64th. He joins us via telephone. Uh, good morning, Adam. Thanks so much for being with us today. Uh, good morning, guys. I appreciate you uh, uh, having me on this morning. You came highly recommended by that delegate Mike Hornby guy. Well, I uh, I, I humbly appreciate that, and uh, uh, Delegate Hornby's definitely been a great asset to us down here uh, this year. We're glad to have him as a new member. Very nice. Uh, Adam, he talked about, uh, as I was talking with Mike via telephone one evening earlier this week, about Child Protective Services about the reorganization of DHHR and the foster care situation in West Virginia, which is uh, well a story that's been told uh, quite often over the last several years. Uh, he mentioned that uh, you had written a bill, HB 2538, dealing with Child Protective Services, foster care in West Virginia, and you had pretty intimate knowledge of the situation, and it was a great bill. Can you tell us about it a little bit? Yeah, so um, HB 2538 um, has been like a three-session uh, process here. We've been uh, working through it, and essentially what it is, it is a one-stop communication portal for everyone that's going to be involved with that foster child's um, care. And uh, so, you know, I, I'm a foster parent currently. I have a child in my care, and as well, I'm an adoptive parent. I, I've adopted um, fostered, then adopted um, another little girl that, that we've been blessed with. And um, so this process started several years ago. We became foster parents in 2020, actually right before the pandemic hit. And what we began to see was there, there were major communication breakdowns um, throughout this entire process. And, uh, you know, I first want to say, you know, our CPS workers are, are working hard um, they are they are overworked. They're overrun. The system is just being flooded, um, mainly because of the drug epidemic that we have. So, um, so they're they're trying their best within the system, um, but there's no real way to communicate. Um, that we're still, uh, you know, text, and, and we don't know who to text. We're you know we're waiting on phone calls back, and then we're not sure who answered what, and did they tell everybody the answer? And um, so I began to realize that there needed to be one source where everyone comes together and uh, and they could communicate together because when you look at um, all of the programs that we've added within the foster care system great programs great resources for our parents but they're they're all in their own place with their own uh, communication point so let's bring all them together and let's talk uh, through that so so that's kind of where it started at you as a foster parent have a much more intimate uh knowledge i would guess of this situation than most of the delegates no matter how much homework they do because only you can really understand the frustration that foster parents go through who are encountering the exact same things that you have encountered in terms of communication and such and i think we all agree that the, the people who are working uh in the ch child uh, welfare systems in west virginia i can only do so much we had an attorney on earlier this week lane deal who told us that the caseload in west virginia is uh, multiple times the caseload in typical states who deal with these situations. So we know that they're overworked, they're underpaid, they're stressed out, and, and they are also taking on the same bureaucracy that you're taking on as a parent in many cases, Adam. No, you're, you're exactly right. And uh, when you look back at kind of a, a recent change that was made, uh, I believe about 2017, 2018 uh, time frame, uh, we, we even removed some of the workload from our, our CPS workers, and we started using what, what I would call contract labor, but uh, they are placing agencies, foster agencies. And, um, and so within that, we, you know, we tried to lessen their load, but, but it creates a unique breakdown of communication um, between them. And uh, so they, they are, they're, they're being overrun um, by this, and that's why I think this is a tool and a resource for them, because even within the agencies in the department, we see redundancy in work, and, uh, you know, it, it's 2023, and uh, at the beginning of this year, I uh, renewed my, my home as a certified uh, foster home, and I, I hand-wrote out all of the information. Uh, well, then goes to my agency, who then types that in a database, that then goes to the department that types that in a database. Why are we handling that same information three times? So when we look at their workload, can we use technology to, to lessen that workload to where this foster parent is typing that information in and then instantaneously in real time that goes to everywhere that it needs to go to and uh, for a review process not someone sitting here typing 
for a couple hours a day, um, you know, on redundant paperwork. So, so I'm looking at this, um, you know, as a tool to fill some vacant positions with technology. And, uh, you know, the governor just, uh, put out a good program, um, and, and he's buying iPads, uh, or I should say tablets, um, for all of his field workers. And, uh, so I, I feel like he's on board realizing technology can be a great resource to, to our field workers. Got a text from Berkeley County Sheriff Nate Harmon who says that as an adoptive parent myself, I couldn't agree with Adam Moore. A one stop shop for information and updates when a foster slash adopting parent calls in is paramount. I support the bill 100%. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. Good morning, Delegate, and uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, this one-stop uh, communication uh, sector, there are a lot of individuals involved. Uh, and off the top of my head, I can think of CPS, Judiciary, CASA, foster parents, and others. Uh, who, in this network of people that are trying to help, uh, could you spell out who they are? Yeah, so so ultimately, who we're trying to help is, is the child. Yes. At, at the end of, end of it, um, and then the next level would be we're, we're trying to, to to help the families care for the child, um, and then we're giving this tool to the CPS workers. So so ultimately, all of this flows down to the child to give them the adequate care that they need, because you got to realize these kids come from a unique situations, normally a lot of trauma. And when we've got, you know, counselors and uh, therapists that are coming into the home or, or counseling them at school, you know, we've got court, we've got lawyers, we've got uh, the guardian at litems, we, we've got doctor's appointments and medical history. We've got all of this stuff trying to come together. The, the bottom line is, is we need to get the best care to that child as we can. And, uh, and communication is, is the key to that. And uh, Cause I can give you a couple, you know, prime examples. Um, our little girl that we adopted, uh, we, we were able to get her at birth. We were blessed to do that, but, uh, we weren't told for six weeks that she might have hepatitis C and, uh, and, and it wasn't anybody's fault. It just, there was no really way to communicate that other than by mouth. And, uh, and it fell through the cracks as, as the CPS workers are over overlooked. So I look at this portal as a way to, to, to be able to say, okay, there is a unique health issue here with this child that, that we've got to got to work through, and uh, we've got to make sure the parents know that, and uh, so that they can make sure they relay that to their pediatrician, and uh, and be able to care uh, better for that child. We we had another little girl that came with a prescription uh, to our home. We didn't know that she had a prescription. We just happened to find it in her diaper bag. Had to call back and forth and make sure, okay, we are good to give her the prescription. Um, you know, it, it's still active and uh, still needs to be utilized, but um, but she could have very easily missed that uh, dose that she needed. So so I'm looking at this system to be able to come together. We've got a new PATH system uh, for the state of West Virginia, which is uh, kind of the internal workings of DHHR. Um, you know, we've got Medicaid. We, we've got um, Aetna Health that uh, takes care of the health care for our uh, foster care, allowing all of them to, to come together, communicate together. And, uh, and get that real-time data out to uh, ultimately, I believe, care for that child better. The one-stop communication obviously has a great appeal, but the implementation of it could be very complex. Uh, is this going to be totally electron, uh, uh, technologically driven, or will there be some, uh, some individuals uh, that will assist in the management of the data flow? Well, it will be um, essentially 100% uh, technology driven. Uh, several other states have, have already implemented this. This, uh, um, I should say there's a couple different people that can, uh, or I should say businesses that have already started implementing this in other states. They've seen great benefit from it. But the unique thing about it is, is you can tailor it to meet your uh, state's needs. So, so there will be some, um, personal, uh, input that we can maybe as legislators or DHHR or CPS workers that we can all come together and have some individual input, um, but but the system and the data um, database is already out there. We just need to implement it. Um, delegate, this is Larry Schultz. What <clears throat> percentage of West Virginia's foster care population is currently housed in other states? Uh, is that a significant number of our foster care kids? <clears throat> that I, I can't give you the. Uh, accurate number but but that is not a high percentage um there are some um but it, but it's not a high percentage and a lot of times those are more unique cases um that maybe those children need specialty care 
uh, to meet those needs. Um, but but I would say that's still a low number. Okay. Um, are the um, the technological improvements that you're outlining, are you finding that all the different constituency groups are on board with you? In other words, you're not having a fight with CPS workers or certain parents or that sort of thing, correct? No, uh, we, we've had several meetings over the last several years bringing stakeholders in and, and talking with them uh, from uh, the, the commissioner, um, you know, clear down to, to CPS workers, uh, to, to foster parents, and, and, and we all feel like this is a, a great avenue to bring everybody together and, uh, and move this thing forward. I assume that the technology is a, a, a package, off-the-shelf uh, item. Is that correct? It's already developed, uh, ready to be implemented. Is that correct? It, it is, if that's the direction we go. We don't necessarily have to go that way. Um, we could create our own or, or, or use another supplier, but, but if that is the direction that we choose, um, essentially we can purchase it and uh, – and, and they've told us, we've met with them, we've sat through webinars with them, that this thing could be implemented uh, in about a six-month time frame. And that's uh, implementation, training of uh, field workers, and uh, we can get this thing off the ground. Now, picking up on the point that Larry made a second ago about out-of-state, and you said that's a fairly small percentage, but there are some involved. Would this uh, one shop, uh, one-stop communication system, would that extend to the out-of-state uh, foster ch- children as well? Yeah, I think this is is for every foster child. We we want to get uh, the best care to every child, and and we don't want to exclude anyone from that. So so any child that is receiving care and in the custody of the state, um, I, I would assume they're going to to have an account, and uh, and then everyone is going to be able to work through that uh, account for that child. I would imagine that that you got a lot of support uh, in both the House side and the Senate side for this, did you not? Because there's a real need for what you've described. We did. Uh, we hit a little bit of a roadblock, and uh, and I do have to say this: the bill that was going to implement this um, is not going to pass. But but I, I'll say on the other side of it, in speaking with uh, DHHR and leadership there they're actually going to go ahead and start the process and implementation that they feel like it is such a good idea that it is much needed. So even without the bill and without us saying you have to do it, they've elected to go ahead and start the process and bring it in. And, uh, and part of the issue we, we ran into um, is uh, financial. Uh, they, they, this did come with a price tag. And uh, so we hit a couple roadblocks in uh, Senate finance uh, that uh, has kind of delayed things. And, um, and essentially, there's a lot going on within DHHR, within the reorganization of DHHR, with the uh, new PATH system, which is their new database. And uh, Senate Finance um, just felt like it wasn't the best time right in here to throw something else on their plate. So, so it got held up there and, and isn't going to pass. But, again, good news is DHHR is going to go ahead and take the ball and run with it. Will this um, system be um... – I don't know what the proper term is because I'm not a, a computer scientist, but will it be amenable to use by people in other states? Uh, in other words, I presume bigger states already have some version of this. Are we going to be adopting the same sort of setup so that the two systems can talk when they need to? I, I don't know that I can speak to that other than I'm going to say I think we want our own standalone system um, that, uh, that that as the state of West Virginia and caring for children in the state of West Virginia, that, that we want to, uh, I think, keep that in-house or, or we'll say in-state so, so that we're, you know, there, there's no potential for data getting somewhere where it doesn't need to be or anything of that nature, that this needs to be an, an in-state process. Adam, as you mentioned, the Senate uh, is, isn't going to let this get through. It went to House Finance. Any idea what the fiscal note was going to be on this? So um, they, they wrote a fiscal note of $3 million, um, but that actually dropped to an in-state contribution of $500,000. Um, $2.5 million of that was going to be federal money uh, that we could use toward this implementation. 
So five hundred thousand dollar cost to the state. Well, I'm. I'm can, I want to be clear on this. Did did the bill get killed? because of the money or because of the process of trying to implement this while DHHR was undergoing a massive restructure? I would say a little bit of both. Um, I, I think that uh, when we look at the amount of money and the amount of resources that DHHR are getting, um, there was some just some hesitancy of just throwing more money. Um, now, now, I will say for me, I thought it was a very uh, minor amount of money um, and that we uh, – that it was a necessary thing because it was going to change the lives of kids and families in our state. But, uh, but I was told, you know, we don't want to throw any more money at DHHR. Um, they, they, they've got enough. We're not sure how they're spending it. And, um, and so we didn't want to do that. But, but then on the other side of that, I think it was, Hey, let's not require them to implement another program and another process when, when we're already going through a bunch of changes as is. Larry, you want to, you want to jump on that because this has been your pet peeve. Yeah. I, I know that we have, from looking at uh, DHHR's dashboard, um, I know that we have a shortage of about a third of the positions at CPS that aren't filled. Um, I realize this bill is not directed at that crisis, uh, but obviously that crisis, if it does not get resolved, um, is going to affect the efficacy of the new system um, and the results for the for the foster care kids. Any idea when, if ever, there's going to be a move on that shortage of CPS workers? I think we're fully aware that there is that shortage, um, and 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 I will say this: you know, within the state, but but let's even say in the private sector. I think there's a shortage of workers in every avenue. You know, we have a shortage of corrections officers, police officers, uh, CPS workers, but but even out in the private sector, we're, we're just struggling to get people back to work and to fill positions. But we do have to realize that, that some of these positions at, at the state and CPS being one of them, this is an essential part um, of our government and, and, and a duty of government. And so um, I think we're fully aware. We've continued to give pay raises uh, across the board. We've continued to uh, to allow retirees to come back into DHHR without penalizing the retirement. Um, I mean, we're we're looking at every avenue to to try to get these positions filled. Your, your one shop. Uh... Uh, communication, one-stop communication, uh, obviously applies for as a child is being put up for adoption or trying to find a foster home. Once a child finds a foster home or is actually adopted, will you still monitor the child and the ch- child uh, uh, through the light uh, through the adult uh, to the adolescent years of the child? Well, I, I think there's a key distinction there. Um, that child is no longer after adoption in the custody and care of the state of West Virginia. Now, do I think we should allow parents maybe to elect in if they're still getting resources, maybe therapy or counseling, um, or, or maybe still utilizing the WIC program or something of that nature where we can allow them to elect in and continue to use it? Absolutely. But but I will say it changes a lot. As soon as you go from foster to adoptive, um, you know, the, the role of the state quickly changes um, to, to no longer being um, over that child and responsible for that child. Now those adoptive parents are. So I uh, definitely think we ought to give them the opportunity to elect in um, to continue to, to care for the child best, but uh, I, I don't think we want to require those adoptive parents um, to be part of it. Adam, with DHHR beginning on their own now to make some of the changes that your bill recommends, will there be a need to bring this bill back up again next session? Well, I think we'll we'll monitor it um, over the next 10 months. I'm going to work with DHHR um, as often as I can and uh, see how implementation is going, seeing how we can help. And uh, if it's not going in the direction we want it to go as a legislator, I think uh, uh, we, we have an obligation to bring it back up and uh, revisit it. But if it's uh, being taken care of through, through DHHR, um, I think we'll just let them uh, continue implementation, and then uh, we'll find uh, a- another avenue or an- another issue that we need to help them with. What do you think is a reasonable amount of time to measure that by, Adam? Um, I, I would I would say by end of this year. Um, 
you know, that, that gives them, you know, time. Uh, government moves at a, at a slow process. So uh, getting a vendor selected, uh, getting a vendor uh, set up, and then, you know, there was a six-month implementation process. Uh, we were told if, if they used, um, you know, an outside supplier. So I think we've got to give them time uh, to do that. But uh, let's not uh, kick the can down the road too long and, uh, and delay this thing any more than what we have to. Either of you have additional questions for Adam regarding this particular bill? Uh, Adam, I ask every uh, uh, delegate or senator who is on at the end of the interviews if there's any other bills that they're involved in that they'd like to make sure people know something about because it could affect their lives in one form or fashion. Do you have a particular bill you'd like to relate some information on? Uh, I, I think this is uh, th this was the biggest thing that I've tried to talk about all session. I appreciate the opportunity, the platform to uh, to share on uh, HB 2538. And uh, I, I, let's just keep the focus on it. Let's keep the focus on the care of, of our children and uh, keep moving forward. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, guys. Have Thank a good you. day. Delegate Adam Burkhammer, Republican out of the 64th at 829. Thanks to Delegate Mike Hornby, owner of this uh, radio and TV station, for uh, setting that up for us there.